What's up guys? Welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Ardell and today we drop our sixth installment of the subscriber game analysis series where y'all send in your own games and it has a chance to get analyzed on this channel. Guys, down in the comment section below, drop a link to one of your own games from chess.com, Lee Chess, and Over the Board Tournament Game, etc. I promise to take a look at it and maybe even show it to our whole subscriber base in one of these episodes. Now today's game comes from none other than my guy Kawan, who has been super engaged on the channel for quite a long time now, and he put together a really nice game with the white pieces all starting out with the move e4 and now against the move e5 the most popular option for white at the master and grandmaster level and really all levels is knight f3 attacking that centralized pawn and this can lead to a ton of good chess openings like the Kiko piano italian game roy lopez scotch gambit scotch game three knights four knights variation fried liver attack there's a ton of different options that we can go out of this move knight f3 however there is a move here that is very underrated and is not played enough and that's the move knight c3. Now at first sight, this doesn't really appear to make any threat, and it doesn't. We're not threatening to take the pawn on e5, but really what we're trying to do is just naturally develop our pieces and really control the light squares on e4 and d5, and maybe, as y'all are gonna see in this game, even attack the black king on the king side of the board in grand prix attack type fashion. Now here we see the move knight f6, and white could continue with the idea of g3, bishop g2, knight e2, castle king side, put upon on d3, etc. That is very normal for the Vienna game. However, here we see Kawan go into the Vienna gambit, a very dangerous system with f4, almost an improved king's gambit position, in which case we're putting pressure on e5. And now black has a big decision to make. Do they want to take the pawn on f4? Well, I personally think that e takes f4 is not a very good move. Here black smartly continued with the move d6 just to let y'all know d5 is the main line in that position in which case i still think that white is completely okay but against the move d6 we now see this idea of bishop c4 and then after knight c6 we see kawan continue with d3 i mean guys this is just good fundamental chess get your bishop out there first and then play the move d3 we would much rather have our bishop on c4 where it's active attacking the most weak pawn in the entire game of chess than on e2 and f1 literally doing hardly anything at all. Now here we see black play knight a5. As I just mentioned, this bishop is very strong attacking f7. f7 and f2 are generally considered to be the weakest pawns in chess because only the kings defend them. So why not play the move knight a5 and try to take this bishop, which is both active and on top of that, go ahead the bishop here. Here we see Kawan continue with bishop b3, just sliding this bishop back. And here black captures the bishop and we now see a takes b3. Now some of you may be wondering, okay, wait, didn't white just double their pawns? Well, in this case, I actually think that it's okay. As y'all can see, our pawns are still very strong and they're all connected into one pawn island. And on top of that, our rook on a1 is now attacking that pawn on a7, making this rook a prisoner potentially for the rest of the game. Here, black continued with the move a6, trying to stop this idea and maybe even eyeing potential b5 ideas here. However, keep in mind, I mean, for example, let's say the move knight f3 is played, which is exactly what Kawan did, and black continues with a move like b5. We simply take that pawn off the board, whole idea being if a takes b5, thank you for the rook. So here black was smart to not push on b5, but simply played the move bishop g4, in which case we now see castling kingside, and following the move bishop e7, we see Kawan play h3, attacking that bishop on g4. Notice here if a move like bishop e6, we simply continue with f5, forming a very nice pawn chain from c2 to f5, attacking that bishop with tempo. And if a move like bishop h5, we play g4, and here black's actually going to have to be forced to give up one piece for two pawns, because if the move bishop g6 is played, we have f5. Talk about just a monster pawn structure here, trapping the bishop on g6, and white simply winning. So instead of playing a move like bishop e6 or bishop h5, which literally loses material, we see the move bishop takes f3. And here we see Kawan simply capture that bishop off the board, getting this queen involved. And following the move castling king side, here Kawan plays the move f5. However, I do want to mention real quick that in the Vienna game, one key idea is this d4 break. Now I know some of you are saying, okay, wait, but we already played the move f4. Don't you have to choose? between an eventual d4 or f4 break in the Vienna Gambit? Well, not necessarily. In fact, here we can play the move bishop e3, and following the move c6, we can break through with d4. Notice here how both our d and f pawns are putting a ton of pressure on e5. If a move like e takes d4, okay, we take back with the bishop. 
if a move like e takes f4, yet again we take with the bishop, and white simply has control of the center. So if a move like queen c7 trying to hold on to the pawn on e5, we can now play rook ad1, just continuing to naturally develop our pieces. And after a move like rook ad8, continue even with g4. Some of you are probably wondering what on earth is going on here. Well, surprisingly, these pawns on d4 through g4 are actually not weaknesses, but simply giving us a ton of space and a ton of activity. Here we have ideas like f5, g5 attacking the knight on f6. We're always eyeing capturing that pawn on e5 as well. This is a very difficult position to play with as black, and if black ever does take the pawn, as we mentioned earlier, we simply take back with the bishop, and here white really has nothing at all to worry about. We have e5, f5, and g5 ideas in the air every single move, and notice here black can't try to find counterplay with a move like like c5 because here we're simply going to bring our bishop back and yes for at least one second our bishop isn't the most active but we always have that bishop h4 idea attacking the knight on f6 and on top of that we have the very dangerous idea of g5 attacking the knight followed by knight d5 ideas attacking both the queen and the bishop and white is simply crushing that game so I just thought I'd mention that to you guys real quick. We can always look for those bishop e3, d4 moves in both the Vienna Gambit and the Vienna game. However, here we see Kawan play the move f5, and I actually still really like this move, forming a strong pawn chain from c2 all the way down to f5. And keep in mind, our bishop on c1 is ready to get into the action at a moment's notice. Here black plays the move c6, and I actually think that this is a must. Whenever you are playing against the Vienna Gambit, Grand Prix attack, any system in which there is a long pawn chain like this, and the opponent is making their intentions clear that they're trying to checkmate your king, you got to find counterplay and break through with a move like d5. So here we see c6 trying to find some counterplay, breaking open the center of the game. But now from white, we see the move queen g3. Koan really putting some pressure on g7 and throwing bishop h6 ideas in the air. Whole idea being after bishop h6, black would more or less be forced to play the move knight e8. But against this, we now see the move knight h5 attacking our queen. And from Koan, we now see queen g4. Now, some of you may be wondering, wait a second. I mean, I just showed that line with bishop h6, in which case black had to play knight e8. Why can't black play knight h5? Well, the issue here is that it's really best for black to just go right back to f6 because if black plays a move like g6, the dark squares are going to be weakened. We can throw our bishop into h6 and white is simply better there. So here we see black go right back to f6 and then the queen go right back to g3. As y'all saw, we just went back and forth. But guys, in this game, Kawan's opponent was actually over 250 elo points higher than him. So he would be okay with the draw. Black, on the other hand, is playing someone lower rated, so they don't want the draw. And we now see the move king h8. Black is not trying to get a threefold repetition, but get this king out of the way. Notice here bishop h6 no longer works because we simply lose the bishop, but we can play bishop g5 attacking the knight on f6. And in the game, black played the move knight d7, but there was a very interesting option with knight h5 attacking the queen on g3. Now, now as white, we really have two different approaches. One of them is playing a move like queen h4, and in the case of bishop takes g5, get that piece back on h5. Another option is to just start taking pieces like crazy. Take the bishop on e7. If a move like queen takes e7, that's okay. We'll play queen f3, attack the knight, and we're just playing chess. If a move like knight takes g3, yes, for one second, we're down a queen for a piece, but now we take their queen on d8. And yet again, I mean, if black just takes our bishop, okay, we'll play rookie one. We're sitting at even material, and I think that white is completely fine with a very slight advantage. But if black takes the rook on f1, guys, we need to be careful here. If we take the knight back, we're simply going to lose the bishop and be down the exchange with nothing to show for it. So instead, let's get something out of it and play the move bishop c7. Here we're attacking the pawn on d6, and if black doesn't move their knight, we're going to take the piece, and instead of being down the exchange, be up two pieces for a rook. So in black's best interest is to play the move knight g3, in which case we can now snatch that pawn off on d6, and after the move rook e8, defending the pawn on e5, we can simply continue with the move like king f2. And after the move knight h5, yes guys, we're technically down in material. I mean, we have a piece and a pawn for a rook, but I personally think that white is better following the move knight a4, and that's because we simply control all the dark squares in this game, and this is very difficult to play with 
as the black pieces. I mean, how do they find counterplay here, especially when our pawn structure is so solid? I mean, if a move like f6, simply trying to solidify that pawn on e5, okay, we play knight c5, throwing our knight into the action, attacking the pawn on b7, also eyeing knight e6, a very active knight, which at the current moment would threaten a fork with knight c7. Black can barely move in this position, and I simply, from a practical standpoint, would take white every time. However, guys, in this position, black did not go for the move h5, in which Kawan could have entered, bishop takes e7, in which case both sides just start taking the other's pieces like their candy, and instead played the move knight d7. Against this, we now see the move h4, and in one sense, I actually like this move, in that if bishop takes g5, we can take back with the h-pawn, and those pawns on g5 and f5 are absolutely devastating to black. However, I also don't really like this move because black can simply play h6, forcing this bishop to get out of the way. For example, if we take the bishop on e7, black simply takes back, and all of a sudden our pawn on h4 is more of a weakness than anything else that our queen has to attend to, and if the move like bishop e3, which is what was played, black simply wins the pawn on h4, in which Kawan plays the move queen h3. And in this position, Kwan's opponent went with the best move of bishop g5, and here Kwan continued with the move f6, just throwing the white pawn into the black camp and forcing the opponent to make a pretty big decision. And black does need to be a little bit careful here. I mean, if a move like knight takes f6, we simply take the bishop back on g5, and notice how h takes g5 can't be played because this pawn is pinned to the king on h8. However, here in this position, I do think that f6 was technically not the best move because black could have simply just took the bishop on e3, and after queen takes f3, play knight takes f6, continuing to trade down. And here in this position, black is simply ahead two pawns, and I don't think that white has a ton to show for it. I mean, we could play moves like work f5, try to double up on the f-file, but black really has no weaknesses. They're going to continue with counterplay, such as moves with b5 or d5, and I really don't think that black has much to worry about here. However, in this position, black did not continue with the best move of bishop takes e3, simply trading off, or even bishop takes f6, which I also think is playable, and instead played the move g takes f6. In chess, guys, we always need to be careful when moving pawns in front of our king whenever we move pawns with moves like h6, or especially g takes f6. It simply weakens the positioning of the king, and we see this in this game as bishop takes g5 is played. Yet again, this pawn cannot take as it's pinned to the king, and following f takes g5, yes, we gave up a pawn, but really what we did was transport this pawn to g5, and we now continue with the move of queen takes h6 with check. And following king g8, guys, one of the core principles in good attacking chess is to get as many pieces involved as possible, and on top of that, improve the positioning of your pieces that are already in the attack. Now, what pieces of ours are already attacking the king on g8? Well, I would say the queen on h6. Can this queen get any better? I would say the answer is no. In fact, in this position, if you handed me a white queen and said, look, you're playing as white, drop this queen wherever you want to drop it, I would drop it right on h6 because here it's not even allowing the king on g8 to move. But what about our other pieces besides the queen on h6? Well, here we see the move rook f5, by far the best position in this position. I love this idea from Kawan attacking the pawn on g5. And notice here if black lets us just take the pawn on g5, black is going to have to give up their queen. And the only way to stop this is by playing the move f6. Some of you may be wondering, okay, wait, why did we play the move rook f5 if this rook is simply going to be stopped by f6? Again, guys, it's in our advantage the more that our opponent moves the pawns in front of their king. And now with the pawn on f6, it no longer defends g6. So we play rook f5, force f6, and now we slide our queen into g6 with check. And following king h8, yet again, how can we get more pieces involved? I mean, our queen on g6, yet again, is in a supreme spot. Our rook on f5 is active. What about our knight on c3? I mean, if we played a move like knight e2, knight g3, knight h5, this would give black too much time. I mean, they could continue with moves like queen e7, try to get this queen on g7 or h7, and fight for the safety of this king. So here from Kawan, we see the brilliant move king f2, getting this rook on a1 involved in the attack, and there's really nothing that black can do about it. Notice here that this rook literally could not be further from the king, but it's one move away from checkmating it with rook h1. And here after the move queen e7, we see rook h1 with check. And here black simply resigned the game. Whole idea being if queen h7, we could take back with the rook or even the queen. And we have ourselves a game over. I also do want to mention guys, king f2 was not the only way to win. We could have also played the move rook f3, 
forcing a mate in one. And after g4, yet again forcing black to continue pushing their pawns, attacking our rook, and stopping h3. Okay, we play rook f5, do this little rook dance, get that pawn to g4. Rook h5 on the way, we're simply winning, but let's be honest, king f2 simply looks much more cool. Thanks for watching today's video. If you'd like to learn the theory behind the Vienna Gambit, click the video to the left. If you'd like to see our entire playlist on the subscriber game analysis series, click that video to the right. Leave a comment below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.